get us to where we're heading to. We'll give you a few moments to get there. And we'll be ready if you will stand in honor of the Word of God as we prepare to read this holy divine Word. And it reads in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what shall I answer when I am reproved? And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablet, that he may run that readeth it. Verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. You may be seated. I want to use, reiterate verse number two. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablet. The tables, I'm sorry, upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. The message that the Lord had given me today is entitled, Run with the Vision in 2020. The year we see clearly. Run with the vision in 2020. The year we see clearly. Here in this particular text, we find the prophet Habakkuk. He decides to have a conversation with God. Beginning in chapter 1. We gave you chapter 2, first three verses, but we're going to go to chapter 1 and bring you back to chapter 2. But he began to have a conversation with God, and he asked God a few things, and God gave him an answer to his question. It wasn't particularly the answer he was looking for, but it was an answer that he needed to hear, and it was beneficial for him. But before I get too deep into that particular text, I want to break down a few things that is important to understand. The first part of this message deals with running with the vision, a vision, vision itself. And I want to deal with what a vision is. The Bible lets us know that it's important to have a vision because that's where we gain direction. We, we can't progress and we cannot move forward if there's no vision. We would even perish, we would even uh, not admit we miss the mark if we have not a vision and we need the vision to come from God to make sure that it's in His will and that we know it will be successful if it comes from God. But I want to break down the word vision first of all. The word vision, as defined in the, in the dictionary, is a revelation from God concerning something or an event that shall come to pass in the future. It is a revelation from God concerning some things or events that shall come to pass in the future. Now, of course, just like many other words and almost any other words, the word vision have other definitions depending on how you use it in context. But in this particular context, we're talking about the vision that comes from God. And this vision is one that is a revelation where you're enlightened, where you're able to see uh, God uh, showing you something that he's going to do in the future. And it could be the very near future, but it is something that is going to come to pass. And God gives us revelation of that. He reveals that information, that knowledge unto us so that we can use that knowledge uh, to help us in whatever situation that we may be currently in or whatever situation we are going to face. And that vision always comes from God to help us to know that this is what's going to happen no matter what it looks like right now. 
This is what's going to happen. Whatever the vision says is what we can hold on to to know that that's what's going to come to pass. Many times when a vision comes, shortly after the vision comes a lot of trials and testing and a lot of oppositions. Because God gives us a vision to help us to get to have something to hold on to that when we get ready to go through some tough times, we have something to sustain us while we're going through turbulent times in our lives. So it becomes something of a, a life for a life vest, if you will, or a life rope to hold us up until the vision manifests itself and come to pass in our current life and situation. So the word vision is defined as a revelation from God concerning some theme or things or events that shall come to pass in the future. And it very well means, in most cases, near future. The Hebrew word for vision is kazon. And this word means also a revelation from God. Something that is revealed from God, the knowledge that comes from God that is revealed unto a person or a people, that's what a vision is, and God sends it. So it's a it's a kazal, which in the Hebrew word means revelation from God. Now many times when we talk about uh, 2020, because it's run with the vision in 2020, I want to speak on 2020 for a moment. Because this is the year that we're currently in, 2020. So God is telling us in the year 2020, run with the vision. The vision that God has already given us, he's telling us to run with that vision. Because God is going to bring it to pass in this year 2020. Because 2020, when we, when we hear that reference in other, uh, uh, in other contexts, Many times it refers to being able to see clearly. It, it talks about our physical vision, 2020 vision, which means it represents a good vision. And when we go to our, uh, our doctors and, and uh, eye specialists, opt obstetrician, I believe they're called, and uh, anyway, when we go and get our eye exam, and they give us a chart, Usually, and it have different alphabets, and, and as you read down those charts, they usually start with larger letters, and then as you go on down, the letters get smaller and smaller. And traditionally, they have us uh, to read, and even if it's looking into one of those uh, optical lenses, it usually is going to, uh, whether we know it or not, it distance uh, what we're seeing about 20 feet. Even when we look into those lenses, they like for uh, us to be 20 feet away and they have us to read down that particular uh, alphabet along that chart. And depending on how far down that we can read uh, to that, on that particular chart, it gives them an indication of what kind of vision we have physically. Can, how old do we have 2040, 2020, 2030? Uh, 2050, all of that matters and what's considered 20 vision, I mean a good vision is 2020. And what that really means is that we're able to see from a distance of 20 feet uh, away, we're able to see things clearly at 20 feet, uh, 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 from a 20 feet distance, things that everybody else, normal vision people can see at 20 feet away. Now if it's 2050, that means that you can only see, uh, you cannot see at 2020, you cannot see 20 feet away with clear vision what a normal people can see at 2020. It takes you, you have to be, uh, what a normal people can see at 50 feet, at 20 feet away, uh, 50, uh, what was it, 50 feet away, 20 vision, uh, you got 20 to 50. What normal people can see uh, from a distance of 20 feet, it takes you 50 feet away to see it. And all of that distance gives them an indication where your eyesight is. But normal vision is being able to see clearly from 20 feet what normal vision people can see from 20 feet. But if, it's, if normal people can see it 50 feet away, and you have to get 20 feet closer to see what normal people can see 50 feet away, then that means your vision is 2050. And that means that you're not seeing as clearly. If your vision is 2030, what normal people can see at 20 feet away, it take, uh, uh, at 30 feet away, you can only see it at 20 feet away. So then that lets them know that your vision is not 
clear, it's not strong. That means that you have some uh, visual impairments and that they treat us for that accordingly or we get different lenses and we wear glasses or if it's contacts, then we wear a certain contacts to make up the gap to where we all be able to see from 20 feet away what normal vision people can see at 20 feet away. And so that is just an indication of how they judge the clarity and sharpness of the vision. And so when we hear the word 2020, that means that you're able to see clearly you have good vision. And so in this year of 2020, God is going to give us good vision in the spiritual realm. We're going to be able to see clearly what God is doing and how he's moving in our lives. Maybe in last year, maybe you were seeing 2050 where you couldn't see clearly because if your vision is 2050, that means you can't see clearly where everybody else is standing 50 feet away from that object and seeing it clearly. You got to get closer to see it, but God didn't allow you to get closer in 2019, but in 2020, he's going to allow us to get closer so we can see clearly at 2020 with the vision that he'd given us. So you're not going to, we're not going to be in the dark about what God is doing. And I know that in 2019, there was many different challenges that happened. And many times we wondered, and some of you wondered, where is God and what is he doing in this situation? I don't see him. I don't understand. There's no clarity in how and why or how he is working in my life and in my situation. So we were dumbfounded and we, some were confused and some even were frustrated because your vision, your, you couldn't see what God was doing. You could not understand what God was doing and how he was moving in your life. Well, God says in 2020, he's giving you clarity. He's given us clear vision where we'll see what he's doing and how he's moving in our lives so we can run with the vision clearly the way God has established us to run with it. It's hard to run and to go a direction when you can't see where you're going. It's hard to proceed forward when you don't know which direction you're going in and whatever direction you're going in, if you don't see clearly, then you're afraid to make a step because you don't know what you're stepping on because you cannot see. Well, God said he's removing the lenses that, and, the, and the blindfolds from our eyes in the spiritual realm. So we're going to see what God is doing and we're going to be able to know how he's operating clear with clarity. God has given us 20-20 vision in the spirit Ram, so we will see what he's doing in this year. Yes. Now I'm getting back to Habakkuk. In this particular text, there's not a whole lot that is known by the prophet Habakkuk. As a matter of fact, many scholars have, have wondered about his early life and wondered about a lot of parts of his, his upbringing and how he got to the place where he's at. And even many uh, differentiate, many different have differences on when his, he prophesied and when he uh, actually operated under which king did he prophesy under. All of those, many of those details are cloudy and many uh, Bible scholars still don't know the answers to that. But one thing we do know the answer to is the fact that he was a prophet that was used by God. A man of God that God used uh, to speak forth his word to his people. And here in this particular book of Habakkuk, if we flip over to chapter one, we see that Habakkuk decides to ask God a question. And the question he asked God in so many words was, why am I seeing, why are you allowing me to see such destruction and pain and hurt and agony? Because there's so much going on around me, Lord, uh, where there's justice have been perverted and, and there's so much uh, death and there's so much evil all around. People are doing everything that they want to do. There, there were even uh, people who was calling wrong right and right wrong and people was acting as if uh, they can make their own choices in life and have no consequences. They did not, people was not loving and caring for one another. All he saw was evil and turmoil. They were worshiping idol gods and, and even with, if you go to the judge, judges was taking bribes and, and you couldn't trust the, the law officials there in his time. Everything was such corruption everywhere that he began to cry out to God because of the agony and pain that he felt just looking and being around all 
all of the evil atrocities that was going on in his day and time. And so he began to ask the Lord, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry unto thee? And uh, the burden of which Habakkuk prophet did see, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry unto, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. He was talking about all the violence and all the death and murder that was going on, the rapings and, and prostitutions. It was just almost any sin that man could think of, they were doing it in Habakkuk's time. And so Habakkuk, just like any saint of God, if, if, you, if we're around and we're seeing evil around us, just as we're seeing in our time now, we could even cry out to God as Habakkuk did and say, Lord, help, Lord. We're, why, how long are we going to have to look and see man turn from you? How long are we going to have to hear falsehood and lies being spread? Just like in our country, you can't even trust the news media. News is such, it's so fake, there's so much fake news and, and, and they make the president sound like he's a vicious animal and that's a lie. If you listen to the news, you will be one of the most deceived person in this country. Because the news media is just like it was in Habakkuk's time. People have gotten to the places that they want to manipulate people's minds to make you see things the way they want you to see them. They want you to believe things the way they want you to believe. And it's unfortunately that most of the corrupt people in our society have access to media and are running the media, the mass media. And so they put lies out and they tell lies and people that are not watchful and, and prayerful follow the lies and believe the lies. President uh, Trump has gotten more from this country than Obama ever did. Amen. Believe it or not, it's true. Right. Look at the facts. But a lot of people don't search and research to find out truth. But they just listen and you hear the news and that's what lies are being spread. Just like even in Habakkuk time, they spread lies. Even in Jesus time, they spread lies. They told people that Jesus was the devil himself, Beelzebub. And people that was weak-minded enough would even believe it. Well, maybe he is working miracles through the devil. The devil is empowering him. What kind of person could lie on Jesus? But they did. And believe me, if they lie on Jesus, they're going to lie on everybody. And so the world, when it becomes corrupt, and we're living in corrupt times, what kind of world can you imagine that even, even our children, our women, and our children are put on the back burner and put in position to where they could be violated just so a few people can be satisfied to go to the bathroom? To allow, a, to allow a person that says that they are men, but their biological parts show that they are not a male, or female rather, allow a male to say they're female, but their biological body parts does not say you're female, to allow them to go to bathroom with little girls is just almost unheard of. It is one of the most uh, uh, evil, sinful thing. And then they twist it and say that, well, then that is equality. That's not equality, that's stupidity. Right. Because we can only, whatever a person decides in their hearts to do, and we expect it, it to override what God says is true, then, then we have a problem, and that's what's happening. Men are conjuring up their own decisions or making their own decisions from their own evil heart, and we're trying to change what God has already established to be true. And then if we're, and this is what Habakkuk was faced with, he was seeing all those things in his time. Maybe not exactly everything step by step that we're seeing now, but there were widespread spread corruption all around. He saw that. He experienced that. And he lived that. And he, and he was so hurt and burdened that he cried out to God, how long, Lord? Are we going to have to see all the corruption and violence and the death? And that's what we're seeing in, in our time. Look at all the violence. Chicago has so many killings every week and weekend after weekend and been going on for years, but you rarely hear anything on the news about it. Killing one another, and, and I, don't know, I mean, on such and historic numbers most years, but you rarely hear anything on the news about the killings. You rarely hear anybody protesting, let's do something, Let, let's come together to stop the killings. You rarely hear things about that. Because it's, it's so much distractions that keeping us from the real truth and from the real needs in society that we forget about it. 
What about the rights of little children? What about children being able to be safe at school? What about children being able to be safe when they go to a, a, a restaurant and they go to a, a business and they need to use the bathroom? What about the rights of a little vulnerable child that we will put an adult in a position to harm a child all because this person says they are something else? We cannot transform ourselves because we say we something else. God made us the way he wanted us to be. God's word is truth. Everything else is false. But I will yield to the fact that every person has a right to believe what he or she wants to believe. Just as I have a right to believe what I want to believe. Everybody has a right to say what they want to say, believe what they want, and I fully respect everyone's opinion and everyone's uh, a right to believe their own beliefs. I totally respect that. But I also expect them to respect my beliefs. I respect how you believe, you respect how I believe. Because God gave us the right of free will and free choice. Just as I cannot overrule your right and freedom to believe what you want to believe, you can't overrule mine. And that's what makes life uh, uh, easy for all of us to get along. But what's happening now, they want to change that. They don't want us to be able to believe the Bible and believe the word of God. They want us to transform and believe what they want us to believe. That's where the problem comes in that. They want to take away our freedom of worship. And that's the devil's ultimate goal, is to take away our freedom of worship. Our freedom of expressing it, how we feel about God and worshiping God. And he twists the truth to make a lie out of it because the Bible says the, the devil is the father of lies. And the devil always twists the truth and he wants us to believe a lie rather than the truth. So Habakkuk in his time was very similar to our time. It is very similar to what Habakkuk was dealing with. And so he cries out to God and then he goes on, he says, why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are they that rise up and strife with strife and contention. He's still talking to God because he's, he's, so in, he's in so much pain and agony of seeing all of the uh, atrociousness that are going on and the atrocity, the trouble, the plundering, the violence that he's seeing over and over. And he's just getting to the place he's just tired and he's crying out to God, Lord, how long, Lord? When are you going to do something to help us? When are you going to change society? I'm tired of seeing the poor being misused and abused and the rich still taking more from the poor and leaving them poor because that's what was happening in his day and time. The rich was taking even more from the poor and leaving them even less, uh, even with less than what they already had. Those that had money was ruling in the land that he was in. And so Rebecca here is, was crying out to God for some help. Help us, Lord, do something. And then he goes on and said, Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. He was talking about that the judgment uh, and, and, and the law was not, they were corrupt. They were taking bribes. They were doing whatever uh, whatever they were paid to do, whatever, whoever had the most money, if you came before the judge and you could give the most money, the judge would rule in your favor. And believe it or not, we have these things happening in our times, in certain areas, in certain instances. The law becomes perverted for those that have money. Many times you see people with, with uh, money, don't have the money to afford what they call a high price attorney. They end up in jail or prison whether, whether there's evidence sufficient enough for them to go and be tried and convicted or not because of, they don't have the money to, to buy the, the expensive lawyers. Many times they end up getting put in prison for longer periods of time just because they can afford to buy the way, their way out of jail time even if they didn't do the crime. The ones that can afford themselves afford to buy their way out of jail time, even if they're guilty, many times are afforded that privilege. So we have some similarities in what was going on in Habakkuk's time and what's going on in our time. And so the Lord began to talk back to Habakkuk and he gives him an answer that Habakkuk had no idea he was going to give him. An answer that was pretty far out from what he was expecting. 
Now, imagine this. Here is Habakkuk crying out to God, Lord, help us. The people around us are evil. And all. Of, and this was, he was talking about the Jews, the Israelites. They, they were all evil and doing all kinds of sinful things. He was talking about their very own people. In their land, all of this was going on. And he was asking God for help to come out of this situation. But look what God comes and tells him on top of that. In other words, I'm going to paraphrase it for you and give it to you in a story form, sort of a story type of form. He tells him, he said, well, I understand there's so many words what's going on, but guess what I'm about to do? He said, you know what? I'm about to raise up the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to have them to come and take Israel captive. Now, Lord, I'm praying and asking you to deliver us from the evil going around us and the people that are around us already committing evil. And now God said, I'm going to bring in your enemy to come and oppress you and take you as captive and make you their slave. And you're asking me for help. Can you imagine the answer uh, that God, when God gave that answer to Habakkuk, how he felt? Lord, I was just asking you for a way out and now you're telling me we're going to be even worse? I was dealing with our own people that was corrupt. Now you, you're telling me that the Babylonians, he said, yeah, I'm raising them up. And I'm going to bring them in. And then he, he began to give them descriptions about it. They are a fierce, violent people. Very cruel. Because Nebuchadnezzar was a very cruel man. And, they, and, and when they went and plundered a country, they plundered it. They went and they viciously attacked it. And then he said they would come for more when they pick their big horses and chariots. And when they come thundering in, you're going to know it. They come in with such swiftness and violence. And their horses are so fast and fierce. And so are their horsemen. And, and they're going to come and they're going to plunder. And they're going to destroy and take Israel captive. Can you imagine you're pleading to God for an answer out of one situation? And he give you another answer that that situation is going to be minor compared to what's really ready to come. And so now Habakkuk is thrown backwards. And I want to go through some of this because I want you to hear and so you kind of imagine how he must have felt when he heard God's answer. God said, look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, a bitter and hasty nation. I'm giving you New King James Version just to give you some more word effects. A bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth and to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They go and take what they, what they want. They don't even ask. They are vicious. They're violent. They go and just take what they want. These are the people I'm sending here. I'm going to send them in. Now, can you imagine how Habakkuk is just probably blown away with fear now? Like, are you kidding me? I was asking for a way to help us out of the crime and sin and what we're having now. And you're telling me we have something worse coming? But that's what he told them. And then he said, verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. I mean, he's building up uh, uh, the fierceness, which were true about the Babylonians. But he's telling uh, Habakkuk in detail just how vicious these people are. Can you imagine if David was getting ready to fight Goliath and God said, ooh, ooh, when you go against David, he's going to be, you know, he's nine feet tall, so I'm say 10, and he's powerful, or 500 pounds, and he has big thighs and big arms. And you just imagine if you're about to, you know, face something like that and God was building him up. God didn't do that. But in essence, this is what it reminds me. If God had done that to David, he didn't do that to David. David was already a child and he used David to be the giant killer. But this is what he's giving details to Habakkuk to let him know all about the people that's coming to take over them and to make them slaves and to destroy uh, uh, Jerusalem. And so they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from them. Then he goes on and says, their horses also are swifter than leopards. They, they have some of the fastest horses you've ever seen. Then he goes on and says, and they are more fierce even than wolves. And then he goes on and says, their chargers uh, charge ahead and their, their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagles that hasten to eat. 
They cannot wait to get to destroy an individual. They cannot wait to conquer a nation. They come with fierce viciousness. So look out. These are the people that I'm, I'm sending. And they all come for violence. Their faces set like the east wind. And we know the east wind have always been a destructive wind, usually. It usually tears and destroys things. It's a very powerful wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold and they heap up heathen mounds, earthen mounds, and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses and commit effects and uh, prescribing this power to his God. Then he stop and worship other gods. After they're going to do all this, then they're going to worship other gods. They're not going to even worship me. God even tell them that ending part of it. But he already tell them that they don't even worry about a fortress. You got a big wall up, they don't care. They build up a, a way, they build up a way to climb up your wall. And they build up vessels that help them climb up your wall and come over your wall and then destroy your city. That's how vicious these people are. Now here comes Rebecca's response. This is second question back to God. Lord, I first ask you how long is we're going to be dealing with sin and corruption among our own people. And now the Lord tells him, oh no, I got something better coming. I got something worse coming, in other words. I got the Babylonians coming. They're going to come and take over, destroy. They're very fierce. They're powerful. They don't play. They're going to take, because God was sick of the sin that Israel was doing. So he decided to do that. That was God's judgment upon Israel because they were committing idolatry in every sin man could think of in that day and time. And that's why the prophet Habakkuk was crying out to God because he was tired of all the sin that he was facing. Just as us in our time, and if you if you're, have the if you have the Holy Spirit, then you should be tired of all the sin and crime and corruption that we're seeing in our time, and we should be crying out in prayer even more, just like Rebecca did. Lord, help us, Lord. How long, Lord, are we going to have to deal with the sins of this world and the evil that is going on? How long are we going to have to deal with our children and life and education and, and their and their well-being being put on hold and our women being put in position where they can be a uh, uh, hurt and harm and put it in, in ways that the enemy can cause harm to them. Lord, how long are we going to have to hear people call right wrong and then wrong right? These are the things that are happening in our time. And, and the sex trafficking, we still don't hear enough of sex trafficking. They had it back in that day and time as well. But on the scale we have it now, even now there's reports now that when it comes to sex trafficking and, and brothers and sisters, young people, when you go to the Mall of America, the Mall of America is a hub for sexual exportation of young women. They fly in from, every, from different parts of this country. You got men fly in, and sometimes they use women, that are into sex trafficking, human sex trafficking, and they fly into the Mall of America, and they hang around various areas of the mall and, and try to get young women uh, to come with them, and then they snatch them, and then they put them into, uh, they take them across straight state lines into various other states where they're from, and they put them into human sex trafficking, and all we know that that person been kidnapped, and you don't hear from them again for many years if they ever come out of it. Lord's willing. So be careful because there's a new, a new trick that the enemy's using now. Now they're trying to use the church. They have people now that are going, and this has been a report if you watch any kind of, uh, uh, if you observe any kind of media, uh, you've probably already heard of it. They're going around, and it's prevalent in Atlanta, but it happens in the Mall of America as well, in other parts of the country, but this is the Mall of America, so it is a hub for people coming in and out from all parts of the world and the country to see the, the biggest mall in America, at least as far as I know it still is, till they build that one in Miami. Now, here, they are coming up and saying, uh, Sister, can I invite you to church? Would you like to come to our church? Yeah, okay, well come here, let me show you how to get there. Come, uh, come go with me. And sometimes they use a woman to approach other young women to make them, make them feel less uh, frightened and to let your guards down because if a woman come up to you and you're a woman, you probably let your guards down and feel, well, they probably right, yeah. But they have people that are using the church, inviting people to church to trick them into dark places where they can snatch them and take them into sex trafficking and abuse them and sell them out to perverted men all around the country. 
So this is a real thing that is happening. That kind of stuff is the kind of things that Rebecca was crying out about. And that's the kind of thing we should be crying out about. They're also using Uber and Lyft. There's a lot of sex traffickers now have gotten a job with Uber and Lyft. And they're particularly targeting women at night and they leave in bars and, 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 and in clubs because they're usually, uh, they're usually going to be drunk and anytime you've been drinking you become uh, less inhibited to uh, your, your mind is altered, you make bad decisions, that's why alcohol is terrible and we say should not be drinking alcohol, I don't care what nobody says. It, 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 that's why a lot of people, the last time you heard from them was when they left the bar or left the club. You hear that a lot. If you watch uh, ID channel, last scene leaving a bar. Because people target women that have been drinking because they know they make bad decisions. They usually, your, your, your awareness of what's around you and your ability to protect yourself is, is very, becomes very vulnerable. You become very vulnerable and you won't protect yourself. You'll go with strangers. Stuff you wouldn't normally do if you're in your right mind, you do those things when you've been, you, you become under the influence of alcohol and or drugs. And so these drivers of Lyft and Uber are late at night picking up women from bars and you don't see them anymore taking them into sex trafficking. Put them in their cars, transport pour them away, they never make it home. And, they're, and putting them into sex trafficking and all the family know that person is kidnapped, missing, and they don't know where they are. These are some of the real things that are going on now. So in our day and time, we have a lot to cry out to God as well because these are things that are happening right now in our time. So now Habakkuk is talking to God and he's seen all these things happening similar to what we're experiencing now. They were selling women and using them in prostitution at that, day, at that particular day and time. They may have used different means, but they were still doing it. And so they were profiting off of that the same way they are now. And so now the prophet Elijah, I mean, I'm sorry, the prophet Habakkuk talks to God again. And then he, he uses a little more tact this time. He said, Lord, are you not from everlasting? Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. Oh, Lord, have you appointed them for judgment? Are you going to allow our enemies to judge us? We're your people, God. You're going to send ungodly, unholy, idolatrous nations of people to come and judge us? He's talking to God. He said, oh, rock, you have marked them for correction. Lord, you're going to let them correct us, and they're more evil than we are. Even at the most corruption that we're doing, they're worse. He said, you are of pure eyes than, than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Lord, how can you hold your tongue when you see the wicked hurting the saints, the righteous? Lord, how can you uh, look upon them and, and, and see what they're doing, Lord? How can you look and allow this to happen, Lord? Lord, I, I just don't understand. You don't understand how this could happen, how God can look upon the wicked hurting those that are at least more righteous than them. Although there was, there's, the Jews were committing all kinds of sin, including idolatry. But what Habakkuk is saying, at least they recognize you as God, the majority of us do. And so how can you allow people that are worse than us to correct us and to conquer us and to judge us. Then he goes on to say, why do you make men like fish in the sea, like creeping things that have no rule over themselves? And he goes on and he compares uh, people being caught up in a net. And then he said, they're going to swoop in and catch us like fish in the net. And he goes on and, and then he said, Lord, then when they get through, they're going to worship the net who helped them to catch the people. So they're still not going to give you praise when you build these people up and you give them a, this authority to come and judge your people, Lord. They're not going to still worship you, which God knows, but God wanted to use them to correct Israel because of their sins, which he always warned the Israelites that if they sinned, that they were going to be judged. And so this was one of God's way of judging them, as he did in various other times with other nations. So then, now after Habakkuk had his say, then we go into chapter 2, where God gets ready, uh, after Habakkuk gave his last opening statement in chapter in chapter 2 verse 1 then God began to speak and he began to talk to Habakkuk. The Bible says in chapter 1 of in chapter 2 of verse 1 I was standing and this is Habakkuk saying he had talked to God and he'd given God his 
his, uh, uh, his view on things and he told God how he feel about uh, what's, what God told him about the Babylonian Lord. They're more, we're more righteous than they are. You're going to let them judge us. Lord, how can you look upon our people that are evil like this? And now he says, I'm going to stand on my watch and I'm going to see what God going to say to me and how he's going to reprove me. Because he know that he, he had no, in his, in his, even in his own mind, he know that he was crossing the line in his mind. Of, of, of even questioning God why he's going to use the judgment that he decides to use. That's crossing the line. But God's going to deal with him in a subtle way. But he's going to give him truth. And look what God does. But look what Rebecca says first. I will stand up on my watch. Being the watchman. He will stand on the tower. Being the man of God. He's going to stand up on his watch. And he's going to watch and see and wait for the Lord to answer him. And set upon my on my tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. When the Lord corrects me, I'm going to wait and see, first of all, what he's going to say. And I, how I'm going to answer him when he reproves me. But look at how God responds to him. God tells him in verse number two, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon the tables or tablets that he may run that read it. it. God tells him that I don't want you to write down the vision I'm about to give you. And in that day and time, they had big old clay tablets or big old clay boards that they would put in the front of the city. Big old, huge clay board that they would put in the front of the city. And when they want to give a community message, they would write in big letters when it's a real important message, depending on the size, how important the message was, they would write it big. Just like when you text something and when you try to say, you know, say that you're uh, excited or angry or whatever, you use capital letters, you know, you make it bigger. They did that too. If it's a real important message, they're going to put it real big. That's why the Lord said, write up on the tablet, make it plain. Write the vision and make it plain. So make it, put it in big letters, what I'm about to tell you. That he may run that read it in, is the end of that verse. Because I want you to make sure they can see it first of all. But when they see this message, I want them to be able to run and tell somebody about this. I want them to be able to run and tell their neighbors, tell their family, tell their friends. I want you to spread the word. Because this is important. And so, and then he goes on in verse 3, he says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come, it will not tarry. Because it will surely come, he said, it is not going to tarry. So he said, the vision now that I'm about to give you, I want you to know up front, there's an important time for it to come to pass. But I'm giving it to you now because you need it now. You're not going to see the manifestation of it right now, but you're going to need to hold on to this. I'm giving it to you now. And he said, but it is for an appointed time. But I want you to know this and keep this in your heart. It will, it will, it will, it is going to come to pass. It will not lie. It's going to speak and not lie. Though it tarry, so it wait, so it takes some time. Wait for it. Why? Because it's, it will come and it will not tarry. It's going to come to pass. It's not going to lie. Everything I tell you is going to come to pass. But know this, it's not coming right away. But you're going to need this to hold on to. And then he goes on and God began to tell him now what I'm going to do to the Babylonians. Now I told you earlier, God is saying to Rebecca, how they're going to ride into town and destroy Jerusalem, burn down the wall, take you captive. And I believe they were in captivity with the Babylonians about 70 years, about 70 years. And he said, but look at what I'm going to do. They're going to have their time that I'm going to let them do what they do. But I want you to know this. That great nation, the Babylonian, I'm going to take them down too. I'm going to take them back and I'm going to raise you all, raise Israel back up, but I'm going to take them away from their captors. And if you know your, your biblical history, you know later on, the Lord is going to use Cyrus, a King Cyrus, a the Medes Persian king. He's going to come in and take over. And we're not dealing with that, but I'm just giving you a little, just knowledge. 
And he's gonna come in and he's gonna destroy the Babylonians later on uh, in life. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had already passed on, but uh, one of his successors had taken over. He's gonna come in and take and, and, and take over uh, Babylon, destroy them, take them captive, or well, not take them captive, but capture and destroy them and put them out of business. And then God's gonna use Cyrus, King Cyrus, to help set up Israel back in their proper place to be their deliverer, if you will. He's going to end up using the Medes Persian king Cyrus to do that, but that's later on. But anyway, but at this time, he's telling Habakkuk that I'm going to judge them. I'm not just letting them come in and have their way with you. He said, I know what kind of people they are. Because he goes on and he describes how they're the type of people that's going to always, they're going to worship their own gods. And they're going to say that I did this. They're going to, they're going to say that I'm able to do all, all these things. They're going to think that they're the ones, they're arrogant, they're full of pride. They're vicious, they're cruel, angry, violent people. God says, I know all of this and I'm going to judge them. But in the meantime, I'm going to use them to do my will. But I'm going to take care of them. They're going to lose all of that luster that they have. All the nation at this time, the Babylonian kingdom, when they came and took over Israel, the Babylonian kingdom pretty much ruled the whole Mesopotamian area to, the, to, uh, to all that old east, the eastern, uh, I believe that's the eastern part of Asia. Uh, they ruled most of that whole area. Middle Eastern area and along the uh, Mediterranean area, when I was trying to think of Mediterranean area. They ruled everything. They were the most powerful kingdom on earth at that time when they came and God used them and allowed them to take over. And Nebuchadnezzar became so powerful and, and that other nations and kings would even tremble at the hearing of his name. But God eventually judged Babylon. And we know he separately judged Nebuchadnezzar when he stood up on the roof and he proclaimed, look at what I've done. And God made him become as an animal and roam the woods and, and live in the fields as a filthy animal would do on his back. He literally became an animal-like person. And then after seven years, God gave him back his senses and he came back and he worshipped God. Even though he was an idolatrous worship, worshiper. But getting back to where we are now, now listen to what this really does and this is how God operates with us. Now first of all, God first told him what he was going to do about allowing, allowing the uh, Babylonians to come and take over the people of Israel. That's what he told Rebekah first. Now before he allowed the Babylonians to do that, he, he tells them what he's going to do and what he's going to do in the end to judge the Babylonians so that Israel won't consistently or be in this state forever. They're going to come out. I'm going to raise Israel back up. But I want you to know this, that I'm going to let the Babylonians come in. But I'm giving you this vision. And this vision that I'm giving you is going to sustain you while you're in captivity. See, he wanted Israel to know because when we go through trouble in life, we need a vision. When we go through some pain and some struggles, we need a vision. And see, God sends a vision and then he sends provision for the vision. He provides a way for the vision. But he gives you a vision because you need to know something to hold on to when you go through some tough times. That's why God had a beckon to write it in big letters because once the Babylonian come in, you already know what I've already told you. I'm going to take them down. I'm going to judge them. Just know this is not going to last forever. I'm going to come and wipe them out. They're just doing it for a little while. Just hold on. And that's what God does for us. God give us a vision because we can hold on to that when we're going through some, some turbulent times in life. We have that vision to hold on to what God showed us that he's going to do in our life. How God's going to set you up in your ministry. How he's going to set you up in your family, your home, your marriage life, in your career. How you're going to be blessed above measure. But you may be broke and broken than any person you've ever met. You may be pure broke now, but God said, this is what you're going to be. That's your vision. Hold on to it while you're in your Babylon. Because Babylon represents us in our tough times of being captured and being abused and misused in life, going through trials and tests. When Israel was in Babylon, they had to remember the vision that God gave them that I'm going to come and release you and you're going to be higher above Babylon. You're going to be released and back in your own place and I'm going to take down Babylon and I'm going to 
set you back up. See, God had to give them that so they could hold on when they're in a strange land of Babylon. That's why when we meet Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they had already been taken captive into Babylon when that time came. That's why when we meet them, Daniel was still standing on God's word and praying to God. The Hebrew boys refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar when he said, I'm building this. They built this image of Nebuchadnezzar, this big stature and the image of him. And who all who don't bow down to worship him, he said, I'm going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. But the Israel, the Hebrew boys remembered the vision and they didn't bow down. You see, it's important to understand that's what a vision does. A vision will keep you when you're in times of trouble. A vision will help you to persevere. When times seem like you're at an end, you're at a point where you're not going to make it. If you can just hold on to the vision that God gave you, you'll make it through no matter how bad the time is. You see, God, when he gives us a vision, sometimes other folks won't understand your vision. Sometimes they won't even see what you're talking about. But that's all right because the vision came to you and it did not come to everybody else unless he sent one corporately. But then that's why you have to understand how God operates. So God is telling us here in, in 2020 run with the vision because some of you and, and all of us got some vision but he gave you a particular vision about your life. And in other words, start preparing to see it through and start getting ready because I'm going to manifest this vision now. I'm going to bring it to pass in 2020. I know it's been a long time coming and you suffered many losses in the midst of all of this time that the vision is manifesting itself to come. But know this, that the vision will not lie. It's going to come to pass. You see, I remember over 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago, when the Lord sent us here to Mississippi. And he sent us in March, so next uh, two months from now in March will be exactly 20 years. When I was at the cottage house and over in Georgetown, the Lord began to give me a vision of this church. And, and that's why we're about to celebrate 20 years. But I, the vision had not come to pass yet. And then he told me how to write the vision. And that Sunday morning, he took me to this text in March of 20, uh, 2000. And he began to have me to write down. I believe Evangelist Cotton may have seen my writings. But I wrote down the vision of everything he's going to do for this church. Our, our own building and, and campus and, and everything. And, and he had me to jot it down on paper. You see, that was 20 years ago. But now the Bible says, uh, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Uh, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Uh, you see, the vision is the only thing that can hold you up when you're going through tough times. Uh, you can remember God said this. Uh, uh, you may not be experiencing that though. Uh, you may not even see that though. Uh, but God said this is the vision. Uh, God said this is going to come to pass. Uh, and that's why even when you feel discouraged, uh, remind yourself of the vision uh, that God gave you. Uh, sometimes you have vision that God showed you your family. Uh, God showed you your career. Uh, he showed you your life and, and how you're going to abound in abundance and, and how you're going to be powerful in your ministry. Uh, but you haven't experienced it yet. Uh, but you got to hold on to the vision uh, because in 2020 God's going to let you see clearly how to operate in the vision. Uh, and he's going to bring it to pass. Uh, so I can hear the Lord saying run with the vision. And then so when you read, when you read the message, huh, when you read the vision, huh, you run with the vision. Huh, because he wanted that person that read the vision huh, to go and tell everybody else about the vision. Huh, because the vision he gave Habakkuk huh, was the vision for the whole Israelite nation. Huh, he wanted them to know huh, how I'm going to bring them out. Huh, how I'm going to judge the Babylonians. Huh, how I'm going to release you from captivity. He 
wanted them to know how he's going to free them. So they had something to hold on to when they become captured in Babylon. And so I come to tell you, you may have been spending time in Babylon for the last several years, but God said, remember the vision. I'm bringing you out of Babylon. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to take you out of the enemy's hands. I'm going to put you in high places. I'm going to give you what you have needed, what you expected, what you asked for. I'm going to work. Because God said everything I says uh, shall come to pass. Uh, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Uh, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Uh, go and tarry. Uh, wait for it. Uh, because it will surely come. Uh, and it will not tarry. Uh, run with the vision. Uh, speak the vision. Uh, live the vision. Uh, talk the vision. Uh, keep your eyes.
people boys, they held on to the vision. That's why they didn't do what everybody else did. And the king tried to make them eat the king's meat. Daniel refused. The Hebrew boys, they all refused because they were holding on to the vision. The vision kept them in a strange land. That's what the vision does. It'll keep you in dark times. Lonely times. Hard times. Heartbreaking times. The vision will hold you up. Because God said, this is my outcome. house.